I'm very happy to welcome today Professor Klaus Zuber-Buller, who uh, made the trip uh, for us from uh, Neuchâtel, where he's now a professor at the University of Neuchâtel. Uh, he was before a professor in St. Andrews, and he still spent 20% of his time there. And uh, he's a specialist of uh, primatology, of course, but specifically uh, the analysis of communication and whether there is a combinatorial component to communication in non-human primates. Uh, he started uh, with a PhD with Robert Seifarth, which, who is really one of the uh, most important researchers uh, who studied the nature and especially the semantic content of communication in monkeys and then uh, continued uh, with a postdoc in Leipzig with Michael Tomasello and a short stay at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Berlin before St. Andrews and now Neuchâtel. Uh, but in addition, of course, to these universities, he does a lot of work in the field. The specificity of his approach is really to look at natural communication in a natural setting with a variety of species in Africa, in South America, in Asia, and uh, showing that when you analyze these productions and these communication situations, you can find a sort of uh, combinatorial system. So without further ado, uh, welcome, Klaus. Okay, so <coughs> <coughs> hello everyone. So it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here. I've never given a, a presentation here at the Collège de France. And thank you, Stan, for inviting me here. It's wonderful. Um, so uh, my focus in this series on animal cognition uh, will be on non-human primates and particularly uh, their communicative uh, capacities, their natural communicative ca capacities. And um, the reason uh, we're interested in this, like many people who study animal cognition, is ultimately really to understand our own species. Um, and as you all know, <coughs> we are, biologically, we are primates uh, with uh, a long shared evolutionary history with, with all the other primates, notably the great apes. And uh, depending on um, who you listen to, we did have a common ancestor with the chimpanzees and bonobos, uh, you know, between sort of six and 10 million years ago. So if you go back in time, we and them were one species, and then only very recently uh, split in, into different groups. <clears throat> and so this shared phylogenetic history uh, will have left traces not only in terms of the morphology, so, so we are very similar in many ways to the chimpanzees and bonobos, just in terms of our general anatomical features, uh, but presumably also in terms of the, um, the, the neural structures and the, the cognition that these, um, these machines produce. And that's really um, kind of our uh, main underlying hypothesis that because of this relatively close um, uh, ancestry, uh, we can expect similarities. So what we're really interested in in our research is the origins of, of communication of a particularly human language. And I want to start first with one manifestation of language, and that is speech. Uh, so it, as you probably know, uh, there have been uh, many attempts to uh, teach non-human primates uh, basic human uh, communication systems. So here uh, is one very famous case uh, in the literature uh, to uh, psychologists uh, from the US who argued that, well, if you uh, raise a young chimpanzee in, in a human cultural environment and you give him a little extra help with, uh, with controlling his vocal tract, then uh, it should be possible to teach this uh, little fellow basic uh, human language. And so they, they did uh, use basic, uh, the methodology of speech therapy, and, uh, but as probably many of you know, these experiments failed quite miserably. Uh, so what this little chimp learned, um, despite a lot of effort, uh, was a very small number of utterances that were quite difficult to understand, frankly. So here's this little chimp who was called Vicky, uh, trying to say a uh, mama. No. Okay, so the, the second one was the chimp, the first one the human, so I'll play it again just so you can see. No. It goes, <coughs> okay. Then uh, uh, papa. No. 
Okay, so with uh, a little bit of uh, you know goodwill, you can interpret it that way. And then uh, the third one, cup. Okay, so so maybe um, you've noticed uh, a few things. So clearly, the chimp understands what's required uh, from her. Uh, she she knows what she's supposed to do, and she does try quite hard to imitate uh, these human sounds, but maybe if you listen carefully, you would have noticed that this, this sound production was not really based on the activity of the larynx. So it was some other source of, uh, of, of sound production that, that the chimp did, uh, and, and then you know, more or less managed to uh, imitate these signals. Well, anyway, this, uh, this and other uh, research projects got abandoned um, fairly uh, quickly. People tried with gestures as well and, and lexigrams, etc. Uh, but by and large, this kind of approach to study uh, the origins of language and uh, uh, the, the cognition underlying primate communication pretty much has come to an end uh, be because it didn't really produce uh, uh, that much anymore. <clears throat> Um, so, going back to this uh, observation that uh, the chimp was able to imitate more or less the general sound structure, but not with the larynx, uh, has led to this hypothesis that, or well, maybe uh, what uh, is at the core of the origins of speech is a combination of both larynx control, which we have clearly, I can, you know, I can sing, I can produce sounds at, at will whenever I want, but I can also, at the same time, control my whole articulatory apparatus. I can move my tongue, my lips, my mandibles uh, in, in highly coordinated ways in conjunction with the larynx. And what non-human primates or great apes seem to be able to do is just to control the apparatus above the larynx. And so here is a, uh, it's an anecdote, uh, admittedly, but uh, there are many reports from great apes who can do all kinds of amazing um, uh, um, activities at the level of the supralaryngeal vocal tract. So, for example, here is an individual who has spontaneously learned to imitate whistling sounds from an animal caretaker at a zoo. So, if you just uh, listen to these animals, <coughs> you can see the And I mean, if you remember when you were a child and trying to learn to whistle, it's not a trivial task. You know, you need to practice quite hard until you get all these little um, uh, maneuvers right so that you can actually produce a sound. And for that, you do need a, a pretty high level of motor control. So it looks like uh, this was not the limiting factor in the origins of speech. Uh, more more likely it was the, the, the laryngeal control, sound pro voluntary con control of sound production, which all primates struggle with except for humans. <clears throat> okay, but um, uh, what I wanna do today uh, is not talk about the origins of speech uh, as such, because we do know that non-human primates uh, are limited in that domain, and there are uh, very clear uh, neurobiological reasons for that, into which I don't want to go into. Uh, but what I want to do <clears throat> more is talk about uh, language much more broadly, and in particular the cognition uh, that is required uh, for the, the, the language faculty to emerge. And uh, so it's going to be a, a more cognitive psychological approach, which uh, I think is hopefully quite fitting for the seminar series. And I want to focus on three aspects that I personally regard as essential for any kind of language ability. Uh, the first one, which has just been termed in quotes referential, refers to this capacity to somehow extract meaning from sounds. You know, so this is at the core of, of our communication system. We hear uh, you know, each other talking, and we can, just by listening to the acoustic signals, in combination with our uh, knowledge and, and context, extract meaning. And so the question is, can primates do something similar or not? And I'm gonna uh, present a few studies that uh, we and other groups have done uh, to address uh, this question. 
Uh, but that's not enough because uh, what happens in human language is that we don't just uh, you know, broadcast our thoughts and observations into the universe, uh, but we socially address them. So we have always uh, a, 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 an audience in mind, a recipient, a target uh, that we interact with and that we are trying to um, intentionally inform and, uh, in, uh, and, and communicate to. Uh, but thirdly, um, some people have argued and I agree that language is also something that is highly, highly cooperative uh, in that um, we don't just try to uh, you know, sort of maneuver or manipulate uh, our, um, our interlocutor, uh, for example, you know, just to get them to do this or that, or move away, etc. But we also share our thoughts and knowledge with each other. So a lot of, um, of human communication is really very cooperative in the sense that I'm trying to say stuff to you that I think that you find relevant. And if, if I think that you don't find this relevant, I sometimes prefer just to say nothing. So I do, I do you know, in a sense, help you. I, I do try to interact with your worldview, what you, what you think uh, you find interesting. And for that, of course, I need to know something about your mind. I, I do have to have a theory of mind and I have to make assumptions what you might and might not find relevant. <clears throat> So this is a way, is a third um, a, a cognitive element that, at least in humans, in adult humans, uh, is present and is very essential for language to work. And this whole idea that language, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, is just gossip or has, has emerged through our urge to gossip, in a sense, is related to this um, idea. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so now I'd like to... Uh, talk um, about a few studies that we and other people have done um, with non-human primates. And you can see that our approach is quite different from uh, what's been done um, in, you know, in, the lab, in, the, in the 1950s and 60s by taking primates into the lab and trying to teach them stuff. We don't try to teach them anything. We simply observe them in their natural interactions, in their natural habitats across the world. And if possible, we try and do field experiments. So we, we use the natural habitat as a field lab and then uh, try and uh, explore um, what, uh, what, what happens. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. It's very simple stuff. It is not very sophisticated. But uh, there is at least uh, occasionally the, the option to have some control over the, over the, the, the variables. <clears throat> So here are a few species um, that you're going to um, hear about today. Uh, so here are the two great apes that we work with, the chimpanzees here, and then the closely related bonobos. So maybe not everyone has uh, uh, this, a, a background on, on this stuff, but basically bonobos, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, in, they look very similar to chimpanzees, but they're not. And you only find them here in the Congo Basin, right here you know, this dark part of DRC, and uh, they've been ge geographically isolated, most likely because of the Congo River, who, uh, who splits uh, this, um, you know, this part of subtropical Africa, and as a result, they have evolved into, um, you know, their own species. They're very different in terms of their social behavior compared to the chimps, uh, but that would be another, another lecture. Uh, then um, uh, there's also um, uh, one or two studies on gibbons uh, that we've uh, looked at in Thailand. Uh, gibbons are very interesting, obviously, because of the singing behavior. And then uh, a, a, a bunch of old world monkeys that we've looked at, uh, and also one species uh, of new world monkeys, the titi monkeys. <coughs> um, so um, starting now with... Um, you know, kind of what has motivated this whole field of studying primates in the wild. Uh, just, uh, this is probably the classic study uh, that you find in almost every textbook um, of animal behavior and uh, even psychology. It's the vervet monkey alarm call system, uh, which, uh, so this species has become very famous because uh, individuals produce 
acoustically different alarm calls to different predators, in particular pythons, uh, martial eagles, and leopards. And uh, just to demonstrate this behavior, um, I've got three recordings. So here's a snake alarm call, then e eagle, and leopard. Okay, so it might not sound very dramatically different to you, uh, but uh, there's been a lot of research uh, devoted to, to this phenomenon, and it does turn out that, uh, by and large, these calls are very meaningful to monkeys. And the way to, uh, to demonstrate that scientifically is with what's called a playback experiment. So you record the calls from a monkey who has just seen a python, you record his alarm calls, and then you wait and uh, say, you know, a few weeks later, when the monkeys are just quietly eating or doing something else, you play that sound back to them. And the hypothesis is that if these calls convey meaning to the monkeys, they should react as if a python's around, even though, of course, there is no python around. So, um, so this is some footage that. Um, uh, we uh, got with the BBC when they uh, visited our, our camp. And you can see here, so, so there's not going to be any sound, but you will be able to see quite clearly that uh, we'll play two snake alarm calls um, to them. The first one wasn't super convincing, but the second one, yes. You can see they're just eating and not bothering. So here's the first one. Um, they uh, then ignore it. So we play another one. <coughs> Right, so this is another interesting phenomenon. Either, uh, either he really doesn't understand, or uh, he's too clever and, and you know knew that <laughs> we don't know. But anyway, you saw the so that's the kind of standard behavior to snakes uh, because snakes are typically somewhere in the high grass, and uh, because they don't know where the snake is, they only hear the alarm call. They, they scan, and as they can't find the snake, they prefer to leave. Now compare that with the leopard alarm call. So the same situation again, monkeys are feeding. And now through the playback, um, a leopard alarm call. So you can see that the reaction is very immediate, instant, and strong, and very adaptive. Because the only place you could possibly go if a leopard's uh, hair is somewhere high, somewhere up in the trees where the leopard can't get you. Okay, so here, here is, a, um, so here is a, a first hint that uh, uh, calls can be meaningful. So we did look at um, a, a number of other species, and I want to now talk about one species that we've done quite a bit of research on, the Campbell's monkey of uh, Thai forest in Côte d'Ivoire. And so we looked at males and found that uh, uh, it's just at the level of the acoustic uh, diversity, we found at least six different calls that we could discriminate. I'm just going to play them to you. Okay, so that was a non-vocal sound, so they have vocal sacs that they can inflate and, and make this sound. And then uh, uh, two basic alarm calls, the crack and the hock. Okay, so you can hear the difference relatively clearly. Okay, so it's the same male. But then, uh, uh, an interesting phenomenon for both crack and hawk, uh, the monkey could optionally add this little suffix here. See, in both cases where the circle is, there's a little acoustic element added on to both crack and hawk, which then sounds like this. Oops, sorry. <coughs> Let's just play crack again. You can't hear it that well, but you can see it in the spectrogram. So these are wild recordings, of course. It goes kahu, right? And then hok, hoku. Okay, so you can hear it, right? So there's a little, there's a little extra here, uh, which uh, does or does not have to be present. And then there's acoustic variants. So here's a waku, which sounds a bit like a hawk, but uh, which is complete. Okay, so you can see. So here you can hear the the, the suffix quite well. So we were wondering what uh, what that might uh, do. 
And um, <clears throat> so that's, I'm just going to leave it like this for the moment, but just to uh, um, tell you that this, there's this sort of suffixation phenomenon within the call. Uh, then we looked at, uh, we were wondering why are there so many different call types? Uh, uh, and we looked at uh, the sequences that these monkeys gave. So here again, you have the repertoire, the six basic calls. And then we just, uh, so this was a PhD done by Karin Watera, and we just recorded, uh, or he just recorded natural sequences that the monkeys gave uh, during their daily uh, paths. And he found uh, amazing structure in it. So for example, uh, if a monkey gave these boom calls as part of a sequence, uh, then uh, it was always non-predatory. <clears throat> so there was never a predation involved, but it could be things like large trees falling down, fighting with the neighbors, uh, or, or a group travel. That, that's when you got the boom calls followed by you know, this green kraku, this one, and sometimes hoku, you can see here. But uh, so the, the, the rule here seems to have been, if it's non-predatory, then we, we start our sequence with a boom. Uh, then you have here a cluster of sequences that consist of only crack and crack who's, these three. And you can see here, so these are raw data really, uh, that this is almost exclusively given in the context of leopard predation. Either they saw a real leopard, or he put out a leopard model, or uh, he played the calls of a leopard, or he heard, uh, or the monkeys heard the alarm calls of other monkeys to a leopard. So that, that's what, uh, so, so, so this seems to be a leopard signal. And then the third large context was crowned eagles. And now you can see here, here you never find cracks, so this call, uh, but you do find kraku, so kraku seems to be a very general alert call. Uh, but now is where you find the hawks and the wakus and sometimes the hawkus here. So this is all uh, crowned eagle uh, related. So, so there is an interesting um, um, <coughs> patterning here going on. And you can now start wondering what the, what the rules might be to, to explain this system. And we haven't cracked it completely. Uh, but certainly this first one with booms present or not has caught our attention. And so here is a, a, a playback experiment that um, uh, I've done a while ago, where I simply play back a series of hawks, which if you remember are eagle-related calls, or crocs, which are leopard-related alarm calls, and uh, so from the Campbell's monkeys. But I didn't play back to the Campbell's monkeys themselves, but to another species, the Diana monkey, who shares the same habitat, they often form mixed species groups and uh, tend to live together. So the, the prediction was that, well, if they live together, they should understand each other. And you can see that uh, what happens is if you play hawks, then the Diana monkey here in stripe gives his own eagle alarm calls. If you play a crack, then the Diana monkey gives his leopard alarm calls. So, you know, good, good demonstration that uh, communication can happen between species uh, almost like a foreign language, if you want. Uh, but now, in the key condition, we added booms in front of these hack or crack series. See here, illustrated by this red dot. And did the same thing again. And now you can see what it, what it does, what the effects are on the Dynamonkey. If you do boom hawk series, no Dynamonkey ever gives uh, eagle arm calls anymore. It has completely abolished uh, the meaning of this hawk sequence. And uh, with the croc uh, sequence, uh, there, there, are, there were some uh, uh, leopard alarm calls, but significantly fewer uh, than without the boom. So the boom seems to be modifying the meaning of uh, these two, two uh, sequences uh, in the sense that it takes away the, the predation specificity that you've got in these, in these two ones. Okay, so, but there's more work needed because if you remember, there are other sequences that we should look at. And um, so we just recently had another PhD student uh, in, in Thai. So this is work, by the way, done in collaboration with Alban Le Masson from the Université de Rennes. So, um, uh, so there's uh, Camille Coy who looked at the, the crack here. So just to uh, refresh your auditory memory here. Crack and crack who? Okay. 
So this, this uh, suffixed and unsuffixed version, so this is a proper leopard alarm, and this is the general alert uh, that that's, um, you know, emerges from uh, adding the suffix. And so uh, in her experiment, what she did is she played back croc and croc-coup uh, again to Dynamonkeys, the way uh, we've done it earlier. Uh, but now she also constructed artificial uh, uh, calls uh, by, if you follow here, so here's a croc-coup. So she cut the oo bit away, which then left her with the just croc bit, okay? And then she she glued the oo bit to a natural croc, which is this one, and the prediction is that if this suffix really carries any, any kind of meaning by making, the, making it from a leopard specific to a general to an alert call, then this manipulation should do the same trick. So monkeys should react the same to uh, um, you know, this natural call and this artificial call and uh, as opposed to this natural call and this artificially cut call, if you, if you see the logic. And so she did the same thing, uh, played it back to Dynamonkeys, and there's a whole bunch of results, and we did um, modeling, and overall, yes, it turned out that uh, whether or not the suffix was present significantly explained the vocal behavior of the Dynamonkey. So there was, all, there was other things that played a role, which I'm not gonna go into, but the presence or absence of the suffix explained uh, uh, how the monkey, the dynamonkeys reacted. So here is just the males, for example, you can see uh, natural cracks and artificial cracks uh, for, for, the di for the male is exactly the same thing in terms of how his vocal response and uh, a kraku, natural and artificial as well, significantly different, etc. And here's some female responses, uh, which I don't wanna discuss anymore in detail. <clears throat> okay, now another monkey that, uh, we also looked at, which is uh, also quite uh, interesting, is the Potinos monkey in Nigeria. And here you got, uh, very similar to the Campbell's monkey, you have sequences of calls uh, to eagles, so this would be the hawk equivalent. Or a crack equivalent, which for historical reasons are called piaus here, but it's the same basic call type. So you can see again, it's the same basic behavior that uh, eagles and leopards trigger acoustically different calls, and these calls tend to be given in sequences. But then, uh, in addition, uh, we, so this is work done with Kate Arnold. Uh, Kate found that every so often you get these sequences where both calls are produced, and first it drove us mad because it goes against you know, any kind of theory that we knew of. We couldn't understand why suddenly uh, the monkey would give piao hack combinations just like this one. Okay, so you didn't know what to do with that. And moreover, what was worse, sometimes there wasn't even a predator around. And the monkeys just did that. And so uh, we looked into the data and uh, Kate then found that um, every time that these piao hack combinations were given by a male, about 15 minutes later, the group started to move. And so that, uh, we thought, well, this uh, you know, is quite striking. Maybe, maybe it is an, is an initiation of group travel, and uh, the male just uh, combines two of his calls to make this, this third sequence to convey something else. Uh, so we did an experiment and uh, elicited natural call sequences in males and simply recorded, did or did the male not give a piao hack sequence in his calls here, yes or no? And then every time we measured the distance traveled over the next hour from the group. You can see that if the male called and if there was a piao hack combination somewhere in his calls, in his call sequence, then uh, on average the group would have traveled, uh, you know, around 100 meters, which is obviously quite far in a, in a forest habitat. Uh, but if he called and did not give a piao hack uh, sequence, then they tended to stay around. So uh, we thought, well, that's uh, quite striking. So we did another playback experiment, um, <clears throat> so which is here on the right. So first here, 
what, what you see here is just the behavior of individual monkeys after their male has given either just piaus, just hacks, or a piao hack combination. You can see here. And here we simply measured how far would this individual travel uh, in the next, I uh, can't remember, 30 minutes or so, or an hour. And you can see that if, after a series of piaus, they tend to stay after a series of hacks, which indicates eagle, they, they, they tend to be even less mobile. But after a series of piao hack combinations, that, that's where you see most movement. So in the, in the experiment, we did exactly the same thing. We recorded natural piaus, hacks, uh, piao hack combinations, and then we also constructed artificial piao hack combinations, uh, hit the speaker somewhere in the vicinity, roughly from where the male was positioned, played one of these four series, and then simply measured how far would our focal animal travel in relation to the speaker. And you can see that the experimental data pretty much mirror the observational data, uh, the only difference being that the travel distance was, was lower than in, in natural situations, which perhaps is not surprising because I'm sure at some point they realized, well, you know, this is weird. Where is the male? I just heard the male. He's not around, etc. So that might have explained that. But the general pattern, as you see, is the same. Um, okay, now, um, uh, so, so, so far we've been talking about old world monkeys um, who are, so the, the ones I've discussed, are relatively closely related to each other. So there's a worry that maybe this is just kind of a, um, you know, a specific adaptation in, in this group of primates, and it's perhaps not a general feature of primate cognition and communication. Uh, so to address this, uh, we did uh, a study in Brazil with titi monkeys, you know, it's this very tiny little uh, New World primate that lives in monogamous family groups with a few infants. And uh, they're very, very, uh, uh, you know, easy, obviously, for predators to, to, to threaten because they're small. Uh, yet they turn out to have two alarm calls. Now we were very, very disappointed when we heard those because they're almost nothing. So here is the first one. Okay, so this is a primate. Sounds like, uh, I don't know, a bird or so. Uh, so that was the first call type, which if you look in the spectrogram is characterized by this little uh, down sweep here. Uh, but then there was another one, the call B, which is the opposite, is kind of an up sweep. Okay, there we go. Okay, so this is the other alarm call that we, we, we got from this Primate, so we, we did first do what uh, you know what's proper and did a playback. We played either call A in black or call B in gray, two different monkeys, and simply measure what do they do. And you can see there was three types of reactions. Either they would look up towards the sky, they would look down onto the ground, or towards the caller. There was these three basic gazing <laughs> reactions. And now you can see that uh, if you play in call A, then the, 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 well, the most obvious reaction is that they look up. They rarely look down and they rarely look to the caller. So we concluded that call A most likely is, a, is a, a, an aerial predator alarm. Uh, call B uh, was the opposite. They rarely looked up, they sometimes looked down, and they typically first looked at the caller as if to get additional information. Uh, but then, so, so, so two basic call types with two functions, no doubt. But then again, uh, we noticed that they, they never just give one call, but sometimes a whole series of calls. And so we thought, well, we'll we would like to know in more detail what these series and sequences uh, uh, look like. And so, um, so this is also work by a PhD student, Chris uh, Caesar. Uh, and she argued that, well, maybe um, what matters for these monkeys is also where the predator is, not just uh, what type it is. So she used two basic predator types, uh, this, uh, um, this, this cat here, um, uh, and then uh, a, a typical raptor, uh, Cara Cara, and she, both were models uh, that she used. So here's, here's her model. And uh, up here is the real thing, just to show you that the models were, you know, pretty good. So it was, it was, uh, uh, so these were just uh, stuffed animals from uh, 
from a natural history museum. And then she positioned uh, these um, models either on the ground or in the trees. So the, 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 you know, the, the, the cat could be on the ground or in the trees and so could the raptor. And uh, then she recorded the monkey's re reactions. And these, again, these are raw data. So each line is one group, a group uh, starting with group A, D, et cetera. And now you can see what she got. So if she puts the raptor in the canopy, she gets straight A reactions. O means she couldn't determine what it was, but everyone just answers with A. If she puts the raptor on the ground, she gets a mix. Uh, so most or all of them start with A, but then you can see uh, there were some groups uh, who sooner or later started giving Bs as well. So it's as if uh, you know, the, the fact that the raptor was on the ground was an additional variable that was encoded in the vocal behavior. Then cat on the ground, as you can see, straight B, so that's uh, you know, kind of what we expected. But then again, cat in the canopy, very interesting. All five groups started with, a, with an A call and then switched to B. And this one uh, was a bit more mixed, but uh, again, you get a mix of calls. So in theory, it is possible that these monkeys not just encode the predator type, but by combining calls, also express something about the location um, of, um, of, of these predators. So we are working on this now with another uh, doctoral student who is uh, doing experiments along these lines, and we'll, we'll see what, what the answer is. We don't know yet. <clears throat> OK, so uh, now going to the great apes. Um, because, of course, this is our crowned species. Uh, if you do want to make arguments about language evolution, then in some sense you have to have evidence from a chimps or bonobos as our closest relatives, because if you do find you know, these sorts of phenomena in very distantly related species, but not in apes, then it's simply convergent evolution, which is interesting, but not so interesting for us. So uh, the question here was, uh, is there any evidence for any kind of sequential uh, uh, communication in great apes? And so here is a study uh, done by Zana Clay. Now this is done at the zoo, so this is one of the few zoo studies we've done, uh, Twycross uh, in England. And uh, so Zana uh, noticed that the bonobos at the zoo, they like kiwi and they don't like apple. So, uh, but they would give calls to both fruits. And uh, what was striking was that there wasn't really any clear order. So you can see now there is, uh, she found at least four different call types that these bonobos can give to food. Uh, so here is, uh, you know, for example, a bark, another bark, a peep and a bark, and then this animal does a peep, yelp, a peep, a peep, a peep, and then here again, peep, 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 yelp, yelp. And then to apple, you have some other uh, sequences, but basically uh, it, it's kind of a mix. And so I just uh, want to play this quick, because this is uh, just put these four calls together to give you a sense. Okay, so that would have been a reaction to kiwi. Now here the same animal's reaction to apple. Okay, so it's, it's quite confusing, you know, different calls, but given in sequences. Uh, so we did analyze all this, and it did turn out that barks were uh, more common to kiwi than to apple, and yelps were more common to apple than to kiwi. So there was some kind of uh, uh, stochastic uh, uh, patterns in there, uh, but at the level of the individual calls, you couldn't really say anything, because you can see now you know, barks can be given here or here, so you can't listen to a single call and know what the monkey has found, I mean, the ape has found. So we thought, well, let's, let's see, and did a, a playback experiment. And so what we did here on the left, uh, we established two feeding uh, locations, an apple site and a kiwi site here on the right. So the, the, you know, the apes learned that very quickly, that on the right is kiwi and the left is apple. And then we played, uh, when, when they were all inside, uh, from the middle, uh, we played either a, a sequence originally given to Apple or to Kiwi. 
So we paid about four or five calls in a sequence, either to Apple or to Kiwi, and then we simply watched uh, where would they devote most of their foraging efforts to. So in the experiment, there wasn't any food. It just came out. They heard the calls, started searching, and couldn't find anything because there was, uh, you know, we wanted to measure what they did. And you can see now, if you play in a Kiwi sequence, there's much more search effort devoted to the Kiwi site than to the Apple site. And then Apple, which they like less, uh, overall less search effort, but again, significantly more to the Apple side than to the Kiwi side. So in conclusion, yes, they must be able to extract something from these sequences, even though at the level of the individual calls, they can't really learn anything. They have to listen to the whole sequence and then uh, make up their minds. <clears throat> so just, uh, uh, just something on the side here. Um, uh, so just going back to the thing, you can see now there's this peep call here. Well, it turns out that the peep call is not specific to food. They peep to almost anything. You know, when they travel, when they see a fight, when they are all kinds of reasons. Uh, and so, um, uh, so we, we, we're wondering if, you know, why would that be? Why do you have a call that is given in such a, a broad context? And I think this kind of leads to a new area of research which is underexplored. Uh, and here, just to uh, the phenomenon here, uh, so here is a peeps to travel, resting, here is a peep to agonistic fights, to alarm, and here is a, a peeps to feed from uh, four different animals. And you can see they're acoustically, I mean, they're indistinguishable, more or less. It's just these kind of uh, uh, bands, where it's very simple call bands of, of energy. So we did do acoustic analysis, and we could uh, the alarm peeps, we could uh, identify as an acoustically distinct calls, but all the others were just indistinguishable. So in other words, for these calls to have any kind of communicative function, it, it must be, uh, you know, for, for the, it must be interpreted in relation to the ongoing context, to, uh, to the pragmatics, if you want, of the situation. So uh, um, just, just to let you know, not every primate call is very specific to one type of event. Some calls are very general, and then uh, other processes might happen. Um, so uh, just uh, to kind of end this not a section on, on um, combinatorial signals, uh, a study on gibbons. So gibbons, as you all know, they sing. You know, they have these very elaborate songs. And uh, so here are a few song units that you can identify. Uh, but they also sing to predators, astonishingly. So here is just to uh, give you an idea, a duet song, that this is normal, non-predatory behavior, two individuals singing together. <clears throat> okay, so what you can see, it's highly coordinated, and uh, on the top left, it's a depiction of the different song units uh, that they give. Okay, so, um, so you can see it's highly diverse. They go through the repertoire at, at ease. Uh, now, if you uh, show them a predator model, they also sing to the predator. But now here, the structure is different. Uh, what, what you'll see is it's much more stereotyped. I think that, oh, there we go. Okay, so, so ba the basic thing that you can extract so far is that once they choose a song note, a song unit, they tend to repeat it. So it's much more stereotyped, but it's exactly the same song units that you also find in duet songs. So they make differential use of the song repertoire depending on whether or not it's just a normal duet song in the morning or if it's in relation to an external stimulus. And here again, we're working on this with playbacks and we are going to tell you the other gibbons listening to these two song types can easily distinguish the two. They know exactly whether or not the singer has seen a, 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 a predator um, or not. So, so this, is, this is conveying information. Okay, so for the rest of the time, um, I want to move on to the two other 
um, elements of the language faculty, if you want, that I find uh, essential. The first one is this idea that sign a signal has to be intentional. You know, you want to do something with your recipient. You want to change his, his behavior, his mind, whatever. Uh, and then thir thirdly, uh, this idea of being cooperative. Um, so just quickly, uh, there is mo most of the evidence in of intentional communication so far has come from gesture studies. So there's been a lot of gesture studies done uh, in captivity where the argument has been uh, that gestures are being used to somehow interact with the recipient. But uh, I want to show you a few studies uh, of vocal behavior too. Here's just the chimpanzee study uh, in Bodongo Forest. <coughs> Okay, so this is just really to get you into the spirit because uh, that's what we see and what they see, which is pretty much nothing. So a lot of the social interactions that happen in the wild, you just cannot see because the visibility is so poor. And uh, therefore, the vocalizations play an extremely important role because they, they're almost like readouts of what uh, the animal is going through, which then other animals can attend to and benefit from. And what you've heard and seen now is a fight between two animals, uh, the first one being the victim who ran away, but then he somehow got support from another animal, became more confident, and then came back and retaliated. And as he did so, his vocalizations changed. So I can now listen to this guy and know that, okay, he must have found someone to help him uh, because his, his calls changed. So it's very honest signaling. At, at, as a reflection of what goes on. Then within the victim screams, uh, you can also uh, tell that quite clearly how bad the aggression was. So here are three spectrograms of screams given by victims, and we did acoustic analysis, and you can, you can correlate the acoustic structure with four basic types of aggression, uh, very mild, where the opponent was just kind of you know, doing a display or walking in some provocative way, uh, then, uh, uh, but no chase uh, involved. Uh, up to here where the individual is being singled out and chased, and finally actually physical abuse where the, the victim is being grabbed and, and bitten and slapped, etc. So all this you can get from the vocalizations, um, uh, more or less. Uh, and, uh, so, and the other thing is that there's also an interesting audience effect. Uh, so if a victim is being attacked by an aggressor here, and uh, there is no real powerful audience nearby, so for example, only some young animals who can't help, then his screams uh, are acoustically different compared to when there is a powerful audience nearby, such as the alpha male, and just uh, so that's a victim scream who's being attacked. Now the same victim, the same animal being attacked, but with a powerful audience nearby. You can see. So, so it has an additional influence on the acoustic structure. And what's interesting is that the acoustic structure of the victim screams, they degrade towards the more severe end with a, a powerful audience nearby, even though the exact same thing happens to the victim. So it's as if they're trying to influence the, the audience to uh, you know, come and help them, which they sometimes do. So it is, in a sense, a little bit of uh, deceptive. and They're trying to persuade. So these screams function to recruit others to come and help them. And, and uh, if they think there is a big chance to, to persuade someone, then they'll, they'll exaggerate, if you want. <coughs> Okay, so I mentioned gesturing as, uh, as, as the kind of king's way of intentional communication. And uh, I agree, it is very, very obvious to see how, you know, you can see intentionality most clearly in gestures. Uh, here a little study was done at uh, the Lola Yabonobo Sanctuary in the Congo with bonobos. Uh, now this is about sex, where we've seen that a lot of individuals have this kind of beckoning gesture, so they, you know, they're trying to uh, interact with each other sexually, but ideally not right here in the group. They somehow try and lure the 
the other way, and they use this sort of beckoning gesture similar to humans. So if you watch uh, uh, this guy here, um, you can see what I mean. <coughs> uh, sorry, not this one over there. So here, is, here he is. So he's going to, so he's done his beckoning thing. The target animal is down here. You're going to see her in a second. He wants to have sex with her. She's not convinced yet. So he comes back. And you can just see how goal-oriented he is and, and what he's trying to convey with his, you know, with his arm. So that's just to set the context right. Now, another beckoning. <coughs> he leads the way. Another beckoning. And now she finally gives in. He beckons again. So he used his gestures to in a sense, it uh, changed the behavior of uh, this target animal in, in his favor, and, and here it worked. Uh, you also see that in other animals, so here's a young uh, male who's trying to do the same, uh, but of course no one listens to him. <coughs> so that's in slow motion, but you can see it's the same uh, um, uh, arm movement to try and lure someone uh, uh, away from the group. OK, so we did analyze this in a bit more detail, but this is just to um, show you the basic phenomenon. Um, then, um, uh, <clears throat> so another thing with intentions is that it's not just you who has an intention, and, and I think I've convinced you that you can see these intentions in both vocal behavior and gestures, but the point is also that you must be able to understand the intention of the other, uh, you know, to, to be a, a functioning well in these societies. And um, here, a little study uh, we've done with the chimpanzees in Bodongo Forest. And we did notice that, uh, so during aggression, there's all kinds of stuff happening, uh, and uh, a lot of vocal behavior, as, as we've just seen. Uh, but there's also stuff happening later on. And so here, what we did is we waited for a natural aggressive event to happen. So A is the aggressor, uh, V is the victim. And then we followed the victim for about two hours, the aggressor was gone. And then, uh, two hours later, we played from a speaker the aggressive barks from an ally, a friend of the former aggressor, or someone else, okay? And uh, because these chimps um, you know, form alliances with each other and help each other, we predicted that if, you know, if the victim understood that um, you know, because there has been an aggression towards him, that his friends may still be angry at him and have bad intentions at him, then he should react more strongly to an ally than a non-ally. So here's uh, just a call that we played. Okay, this is a threatening call from a chimpanzee. You, 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 know, you know that if you're a chimp. Uh, but what matters is that well, who, who is the one who gives these calls? And so, so here we compared ally and non-ally after uh, two hours after aggression, and you can see the reaction was very, very different. If it was a non-ally, they don't care, they just keep on feeding, whatever. If it's an ally, they look towards the speaker, are quite worried, and you can see, you know, 30 seconds of looking, so they're really, you know, wondering what's going on. And also in terms of locomotion behavior, if you play them an on ally, they can even approach the speaker sometimes. They want to know what's going on, or they just stay neutral. Uh, but if it's uh, um, an ally, then they move away. So they clearly know something about the behavior of others, the likely behaviors of others that happen, even if it's two hours after uh, the key event. Um, so there's more studies on this, but just to kind of give you a flavor uh, of what goes on. So in the final section, which I find the most difficult one uh, to work with, is this idea that uh, human language is highly cooperative. We, we, we want to be informative. We have what's in German called the Mitteilungsbedürfnis. We really want to be meaningful to the other. We want to say stuff that's relevant uh, for the other. Uh, and uh, the question is, do we see this kind of uh, uh, level of um, helpfulness in primary communication or not? <clears throat> and uh, so, I mean, I think the answer is so far mm, probably not, but uh, there are a few, well, it's just two or three studies I want to quickly 
uh, discuss uh, that indicate that there is at least some kind of uh, connection going on between uh, uh, primate signalers and the recipients. Uh, this is a study, again, with the Bonobos in Lola, a gesturing study, uh, where we um, uh, interact with them as, as human beings. And what they do is, uh, during feeding time, uh, they come to the fence, as you can see, and they usually have one caretaker who gives them food. And each Bonobo has a, a repertoire of gestures to, to try and get the food. And some gestures are general, like just simple begging, you, know, you hold out your hand. But then some animals have developed idiosyncratic personal gestures, which they only seem to use with this particular uh, caretaker. So here's a female trying to get food now. You can see what she's doing. OK, so you can see it works. So she has developed this signal specifically for this caretaker to, to somehow convince him to give the food to her and not to all the others. So that's the basic phenomenon. So we thought, well, this is interesting. Uh, and the prediction is, well, if they really understand that this signal is sort of between me and you, you know, because you're my caretaker and I know that you, know, you understand me, then she should, should not use this signal uh, to just anyone who doesn't know her. So we did an experiment uh, by showing up with a familiar caretaker and an unfamiliar caretaker who then did all kinds of things. And so in the first analysis, this is simply just to show you uh, that they do pay attention uh, uh, about what the other does. So the, the caretaker could be either attentive, left, or inattentive, uh, right. And uh, so inattentive, just being you know, looking around and not paying attention. And then we simply counted how many silent signals or how many audible signals did these different individuals produce. And each line is one individual. And you can see that if they're um, attentive, uh, they're much more likely to give silent signals than uh, if they're inattentive, they're much likely to give audible signals. So they understand something about the attentional state of their uh, recipient. But this has already been known, so this is just a replication. Um, so, but what's more interesting here is uh, familiar caretake left and unfamiliar. And here we simply looked at the sequences of gestures uh, that these bonobos gave. And you can see that, so here they're trying to convince the caretaker to give him some food. And you can see that if with the familiar guy, if they're not successful, they tend to repeat the same gesture again. It's like, you know, you understand me, so just, you know, do what you're supposed to do. So they kind of say the same thing again. However, if it's uh, an unfamiliar one and they're not successful, then they're much more likely to change the gest gesture and try another one. So, uh, so we, 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 this is at least consistent with the idea that they somehow can de discriminate between recipients who are where they have a shared convention with and others where they don't, because there's no point in repeating a gesture to someone who doesn't understand what it means. So some you know, weak evidence that they, they can take the other's knowledge, if you want, into, into account. OK, now to finish off, uh, uh, just two uh, playback studies that we've done uh, with the chimpanzees again in Bodongo Forest. So this is now natural. A situation uh, where we do think there is some indication that they actively inform each other about stuff that's relevant for others. Uh, the first one has to do with food. So if they uh, find food, they tend to produce uh, specific vocalizations, these food grunts, which indicate I have found food. And so first, uh, uh, we found that if they travel with friends, uh, so they, they never just travel in the whole group, all 70 together. They tend to form little parties of you know, five, six, ten animals. If they travel with a party of friends, uh, they're much more likely to give these food calls here on the right than if they travel with individuals they're not really friendly with. So that's already interesting. Uh, and then we did a playback study. So we waited <coughs> until our focal animal was up in a tree, on a fig tree feeding, and then we played from a speaker uh, the calls 
of a friend or a non-friend uh, to simulate his arrival. Okay, so the, the animal's up there, we play the call from a speaker, and now we want to know what does the, the, the guy up there in the tree say. And you can see now uh, what mattered was two things. It was the rank difference. So if we simulated the arrival of a very high-ranking animal, then he was much more likely to call than not to call. Uh, but equally important was uh, the friendship. Uh, so if we simulated the arrival of a friend, he was also more likely to call than not to call. So friendship and high rank both drove uh, call rates up. Now, keep in mind, this guy's already eating up there. He already knows there's food. He's already had his fix and all that. And still, he, he, he starts calling again if the right individual arrives. Okay, now the final study, uh, just uh, before we end here, uh, is again about predation. Uh, so, in these forests uh, in Uganda, where we work, uh, there are hardly any more leopards uh, because they've all been shot. Uh, but uh, there are snakes, uh, quite a lot, and what you see here is uh, a gaboon viper. Uh, I'm just going to sh show you where she is. There. So, very extremely well hidden, camouflaged. So, here is the head, and then here is the whole body. So, you, you can barely see these, these animals. It's incredible, but she's right there, fully exposed. Uh, and the chimps are terrified when they uh, find one. Uh, Presumably, they have had some bad experiences, especially at night. They can, they can strike, and uh, you know that's usually deadly. Uh, so we, we benefited from that by uh, doing a simple field experiment. So what we did is we made a model of a snake and positioned it uh, on the side of the path and then let uh, our subjects discover these snakes naturally. And what we were really interested in was how do these animals behave towards the snake and towards other animals who arrive later? Because you're going to have a situation now like here where the guy comes, sees the snakes, he's alone for, for a moment, uh, so he could just start screaming, of course, or he could wait and deliver his screams when it's really important for the audience, and that's exactly what they do. So here's, a, just uh, see what he does. So he's seen the snake. Now, you see, he doesn't really say much, even though he's, he was clearly startled. So he gives these soft hoos. <coughs> and then, at some point, he's going to realize that his friend arrives from behind. And as soon as he notices the arrival of his friend, that's when he gives his call. So if you he pay attention, you'll see that. <coughs> Now he's going to turn around. See? Now he's giving his call because, as you'll see, he's just noticed that his friend came. There he is. And he understands, so at least understands something, because he doesn't proceed. He sits down, waits, and probably uh, checks who else is following from behind. So, so if you want, there is clearly this sort of sense of trying to inform each other. And cl clearly, he had no idea, you know, he didn't know there was a snake, so th this, you know, is relevant information for him. So we did a rough analysis here and just checked uh, for cases where the receiver was completely ignorant, just like the way you've seen, which uh, makes calling much more likely, or uh, where the uh, receiver already knows about the snake, and then you see then calling is much less likely, interestingly. So, so callers are much more motivated to call if their audience is ignorant than if it's knowledgeable about these um, events. But, I mean, this is really, you know, uh, quite a rough experiment, so this needs to be done more properly, because uh, it's quite an important question, of course. Uh, okay, so this is really it. So, um, just a quick summary. Uh, so, again, you have sort of a phylogenetic tree uh, with humans and the great uh, chimps and bonobos as the three most closely related uh, apes uh, with a common ancestry um, uh, around sort of six to ten million years. So what we can say is that uh, yes, humans are the only ones with speech. There's no question. I think we can safely conclude that. Uh, apes can't speak. They don't have the vocal control. 
needed to, to produce all these uh, signals. Uh, but to me, that's not the key question. It's more to do with the underlying cognitive abilities that you need to have in place, which is the, you know, the ability to extract meaning from these arbitrary sounds. Uh, to be intentional in the sense that you got your audience in your mind and also to be cooperative to, to say stuff that's meaningful to, to the other. And uh, as hopefully you've seen that there is pockets of evidence that suggest that some of these capacities are in place in these apes, may, maybe not as fully developed as, as in ours, especially not in terms of taking the other's knowledge into account, etc. Uh, but, uh, you know, we do see uh, uh, traces of that. And I think when it comes to extracting meaning from sound, that seems to be a very general uh, a capacity that is much, much older. And surely, you know, those of you who own a dog know exactly that your dog understands much more than uh, you, you would think because he can, you know, maybe understand the relation between certain sounds and certain events, etc. So this seems to be much more ancestral. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's it. So, thanks very much, and I'm glad to take uh, questions. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for a few questions. This was a very rich lecture. Um, maybe I can start the questions. Um, so, y you show very clearly that there is a sort of lexical semantics in these uh, animals, there is reference. I was wondering about the syntax aspect. Uh, that seems to be much less clear. Is there evidence in some of these animals of a sort of order dependency, for instance, mm -hmm. or is it all a sort of bag of words? Yeah, so <clears throat> um, I think, I mean, it's clear that there is plenty of evidence that they uh, can use the vocal repertoire also for uh, more complex utterances by producing different signal types in a, in a sequence. And, um, and there's also evidence that recipients can extract meaning from these sequences. But what we don't really understand is how these sequences are being produced. What, what, the, you know, what are the mechanisms that drive an animal to produce sequence A or B or C? And um, what's also quite clear is that, in, in theory, they would have a, a fully functional grammatical system at, at their hands. You know, with just even with just two calls, you can it'd be like a Morse code where you can say anything really. And they don't seem to make much use of that, frankly. Right. So it seemed to be much more like a sort of additive system where they yeah. could use proportions of A's and proportions That's of B's, but the order. Well, the order, I think the one study I've uh, shown you with the potty nose monkeys where you have the two call types and then uh, it's the transitions from piaus to hacks that's meaningful. And that's, you can also have hack to piau, uh, but that's just a, a general, uh, that's usually an eagle alarm call that kind of phases out, that becomes less important. But the other way around, hack to piau, a uh, piau to hack uh, has a distinct meaning which is very, very different and completely unrelated to, to the other one. So that, that might be the only example where it's not just a proportional system the way you've just mentioned. But you're right, the proportionality um, a type is quite common uh, also in Bonobos, for example. I was wondering in the case of the apple versus kiwi uh, experiments, I was wondering if you had played with these proportions to see whether they would consider yeah. any sort of statistical proportion of A's and B's as a yeah. grammatical sequence. We, um, we, we didn't, uh, simply because um, you know, the, the, you're very limited with these experiments that in terms of habituation, you can only play a very small number of trials, otherwise they'll figure it out. So we, we couldn't just you know, have endless. But, but what we did is we analyzed uh, the natural sequences that they gave uh, to Kiwi and Apple. And then we gave, we, we gave each call a value. So the bark was the highest value call. So we gave them a four, you know, three, two, one. And then we just added up the sort of points per sequence. And it was an almost perfect division between Kiwi and Apple. So there was, uh, if they saw kiwi, then they were the, 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 you know, the cumulative points were all higher than apple, except for one case, 
And when we did play that, then they actually reacted as if it was Kiwi. So, so, uh, so the signal is all very precise, uh, but as you say, it's a proportional thing. They just are probably less motivated to you know, call, and then it ends up that way. It's not planned or so. I'm seduced by this idea because the, we discussed also in this course some years ago the fact that there is a statistical sense yeah. which seems to exist in many monkeys and uh, yeah. also in humans, of course, and that maybe the, the sort of language or proto-language which is available here, the communication system, is making use of this basic uh, sense of statistics and uh, approximate number of calls. But this is a mechanism which is extremely different from human language, Absolute, where you typically yeah. don't make use uh, of an approximate number of repetitions. No, no, it's, it's, I mean, it's clear. I mean, I think we never try to argue that this is kind of the origins of syntax. I think it's, it, it just shows that uh, non-human primates can attend, as, as, as receivers, they can attend to these complex sequences and then, you know, make meaningful conclusions. But in terms of production, I think these are very different systems, and I mean, obviously, if you if you if you don't have any active control over your vocal output, uh, then you know you you're automatically on a very different track. You know, you, you you just have to you know make use of 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 what you know what your motivational system produces in a sense. You can't really imitate combinations of sounds that someone else has invented, etc. So I think that's I think there. The, the you know the, the the vocal control limitations of primates are the key reasons why you don't see any grammatical systems. Uh, Peut-être que vous avez des questions dans la salle. Uh, Klaus Zuberbüller comprend le français, donc on peut prendre des questions en français aussi ou en anglais, bien sûr.